Good morning, everybody. Go ahead. I can open. Tim, you have a you have an announcement yeah, yeah, for us? Yes. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate it, buddy. Good morning, everybody. Learning. Welcome, welcome to Community Christian Church. Um, just uh, wanted to say a couple things uh, for the future. Just one announcement. Uh, we haven't got all the details ready to give you today, but we're, we're putting together our yard sale, and it's going to benefit the uh, Samaritan's Purse, the uh, shoe boxes for next Christmas. So if you're looking to get rid of things at home, uh, within the next month or two, we're going to be putting that together. So we'll, we'll have it here. Uh, we're thinking about adding on to that with um, some food, some hot dogs, invite the community around here to come in and have lunch, you know, those types of things. So, so it'll be a combination of just have people come in and have something to eat and visit and also um, have them walk down this and find out that we're not too bad of people, you know. <laughs> so uh, for the people who think that going to a church building isn't so nice anymore, for whatever reason that is. Uh, so, so plan on that. So if you have some things, start collecting those up, and we'll figure out, uh, give you more detail in the future. I um, also want to say, you know, from all the Christian guys here in the room, we want to say uh, that we're really thankful to God uh, for all you Christian ladies. Right? Right, guys? Amen. And uh, they had a great time yesterday, so that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And other than that, I want to welcome you again. And also, it's Phil's birthday. So we're going to say happy birthday to Phil here. So we'll go thank there. You. Thank you, thank you. In keeping with the way that Mike runs this, um, I'm going to share the uh, scripture for our pastor search. And the prayer prompt today says, pray for the search committee to make wise use of their time during their meetings. Pray for the Lord to reveal his will to our future pastor. And the scripture that goes along with that is Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And... Um, I really like the scripture that comes right after that, so Lori is going to share that part for us. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I really like that scripture. Um, I was on a health and wellness webinar this week for work. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've really had to talk a lot about on the corporate side in the last two years is mental health. Um, we've had a lot of different issues. And. The world has changed so much, and it has been so hard to, to keep up and adapt to all the different changes and, the, and the, the isolation that a lot of people have had to deal with. So we were talking about that, and one of the things that they shared was, um, you know, it's really about our mindset and where we put our thoughts, what we're really thinking about each day, and what we let take over with our minds. So one of the things that I wanted to share today is, you know, when we come into the church building and we get ready to, to praise and worship God, where's our mindset? What are we thinking about? Are we thinking about the issues that we've had this week? Or are we thinking about the wonderful blessings that God has given us and all the amazing things that he does for us and just the amount of love that God gives to us? So let's think about those things this morning because I think every person here, if we think about it, we can say, thank you, God. I am so blessed. So let's have our mindset in, in that area as we get ready to, to sing. And Phil is going to start us off with a prayer. Father, thank you for um, all the blessings you've given us today. We in the praise band, especially want to thank you for this opportunity. There's a lot of thought and, and um, um, prayer that goes into the songs that we pick each, each, each Sunday morning. And we want you to be aware of that and to be aware of, of um, 
just taking the time to think about the songs as you're singing them, not to just do it by rote. And um, with your name in our thoughts and with your glory in our minds, please help us do the things that we need to do on a daily basis to honor you and to show your love to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. So on that note, I'm going to ask you to join us in singing, and uh, let's all sing and make music from our hearts tonight. Please stand. Here we go.
Lord, we just come to your house today, and I hope that everyone here just, when, when we sing these songs or we, we hear the message, and here we are to worship, not because we have to be, but we choose to be, we want to be, to draw closer to you and to allow ourselves to remain on the path that you have for us. Not the path that we choose for ourselves, but the one that you laid out that leads us to everlasting life with you. And I pray that with the message that we're about to receive, you open all of our hearts and we get everything that you want us to out of it. And I hope that you'll watch over us for the rest of the day. And I just pray that with everything that's going on individually in our lives, the spoken prayer requests, the ones that aren't in this nation, in the world, you know what we all need. And I just pray that you'll guide us to the solutions that lead us to you. In Christ's name, amen. You know, I love, uh, I love songs that have verses that are like antonyms, you know, opposites. And I wrote like a, a little uh, verse in a song, and a song that I wrote said, truth is I'm lying to myself. Truth, lie. It's too hot to fish. How about there's a, another old country song. It's too hot to fish, too hot for golf, but too cold at home. <laughs> or the best one of all time is I'm lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. And so I got to thinking about this through reading Romans uh, six, or 5, 12 through 20. And, and the common theme is the contrast between Adam and Jesus. Death through Adam, life through Christ. And like in verse 19, just simply, disobedience of Adam, the obedience of Jesus. Verse 18, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness, act of, act of righteousness was a justification that brings life for all men. But what I really like is the last little paragraph in, in uh, verse 20. It says, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It seems before, you know, the law was even uh, given that sin abound and uh, men was kind of ignorant to it, uh, to God's standards. But when that law was given in the Old Testament, boy, did it ever give the true contrast between God's holiness and us. Therefore, that grace really shows its real abundance that, and that need, that need for Jesus and that saving grace that he gave us. So as we just take this cup and this loaf, let's just remember what separated us or disconnected us from God, which was sin. Boy, that Jesus sacrifice on the cross to be saved and connected us back to God.
Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you again for just uh, at this time to uh, to uh, take this cup and loaf that represents your broken body and shed blood, Lord, that we just sit here and meditate and, and think how grateful that uh, uh, such an opportunity to uh, uh, reflect on a, an act that was so unselfless, that was uh, so unbelievable, unselfish. It, we can't, I'll, I'll, you can't fathom it, and uh, we can't appreciate it enough, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for that hope of everlasting life that you give us, Lord. And just uh, thank you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be back here, and I'm uh, happy to be to have been able to uh, be here with you. I have enjoyed sitting, thinking, and um, actually taking a break from preaching in Haiti because I preach in Haiti online on Sundays. That prevents me from going to church elsewhere. So I worship with the Haitian church uh, on Sundays. And when I don't, I go to try to find a church to go to. And I'm pleased 
help me pray to find a, uh, a place where I can keep growing. Okay, and uh, so far that has revealed itself to be quite a challenge. Maybe to my fault, maybe I'm a little bit too picky. Maybe I look for details too much, I don't know. But I, I, I have the impression that um, when you get into a specialty, I'm a preacher, I'm a Bible teacher, so I go looking for details. I look for details, I look for application, I look for consistency, I look for, you know, time. Yeah, the, everything is tied in, you know, put in neatly. And I know that serving God, Jesus' church, cannot be as haphazardly as the world is looking at it. It cannot be. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians that God is a God of order. We see the universe, there's order in it. And everything fits together. Different parts, but they all work well. Look at me, for example. Look at me. You know, a brain, hands, a heart, everything beating nicely, and it makes me me. You know, I have tons of experiences from all over the place and books, and you have also, but I think God has worked it out well. You with your experience, you, you with who you are, and I with who I am can come together and be one. Amen. That's the unity. Now my question to you today, how do you see God? How do you see God? And I'll tell you why I say that. You see, Peter asked us a question, well, gave us advice <coughs> that we read uh, uh, previously, I think in my second sermon. And 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, he said, be alert, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him. Be firm in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your brothers over the world, all in the world over. I want to emphasize again the term alertness. The term alertness is what I want to emphasize again today and ask you the question, how do you understand Jesus? And I'll tell you how he's presented to us in God's word. Jesus is presented to us in, with different uh, capacities, different roles, different aspects. For example, Jesus comes to us as a friend. He comes to us as a Lord. He comes to us as King. He comes to us as Savior. He comes as healer. He comes as a provider. In our human minds, we have the tendency to pick one and focus on that to the exclusion of the rest. And I tell you that the devil who is keen and who is always prowling around to see what he can use, he uses that very weakness in us to stray us from the path. You see, people so focused on healing, Jesus the healer. They pray for healing in all circumstances because they want people to be well. There's nothing wrong with wanting people to be well. There's nothing wrong with thinking that God can heal every sickness. But there is something wrong when we are ordering God to do it, ignoring his will. Amen. And the devil focuses on that. I can't tell you not to pray for you to be here, for a family member to be here. But I can tell you, what if it's God's will that the person dies? Paul says that I have lived my life with a thorn on my side. I've prayed three times for God to remove it, and he didn't. So I've learned to be satisfied with it. Jesus went to the garden in the Gethsemane. He prayed that God takes this cup away. But it was God's will 
that he went through all that he suffered the night of Thursday, the day of Friday, and that he went up the cross with nails in his hands and in his feet with his side pierced. God's will. So I say as Christians, as we serve God in this world in whatever capacity that God has placed you to do, you must take God as a whole, take Jesus as a whole, because you are utterly submitted to his will. That's what you did when you decided to submit your life to him in Christian baptism. You said in Paul's words in Romans chapter 6 that you, your old self, with all its ambitions, died, was buried, just like Christ's human body was buried on, in, in the grave, and you rose like, just like he did the Sunday morning with a body that was not limited by time and space. You also rise from baptism with a new body and bibbed by the Holy Spirit, allowing you to live a life that surpasses the ordinary human life. Amen. When you did that, you said to God, I accept you as everything for me. You are my God. You are my King. I submit to you. You are my Lord, and I adore you. I respect you. You are my Savior, and I'm so grateful for that. You are my friend. We can talk and chat. Come close. And many of us take Jesus as a friend, and uh, we deal with him disrespectfully as a king. The devil knows that. So we, we emphasize the friendship. Friendship brings you down, to both persons to down to the same spot, to the same level, right? You talk on a friendly level. You know, you hear people say, say, God, daddy. You call God daddy. When you call God daddy, it's wonderful because it's close to you. But by the same token, you have to respect the limit between dad and son, dad and daughter. I had to teach my kids to do that. I'm, until today, considered myself, or she considers me, as one of her best friends. She, my, my, her confidant. She calls me and tells me everything that goes on in her life. Okay? But sometimes when she does that, she forgets that she's speaking to her dad. I have to remind her, I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. Yes, best friend, but I'm your dad. There's a limit that you can't cross here. So I bring her back to that limit. It sounds hard, but we must learn the limit. And when you emphasize one over another aspect of God, you infringe on the other, you insult God, you disrespect God, you disobey God, you do not submit to God, and the result is that the devil cheers because he got you exactly where he wants you. Yeah. These are little tiny things that you don't think about. We don't take the time to think about these details in our service to God. And I think those are so very important. Let's say, let's say, for example, we serve Jesus and we understand him as he is as a friend. He said that um, you are my friend if you do what I command you. That doesn't sound like a friend, is it? You're my friend if you do what I say. It sounds more like a dictator. But it just tells you that the friendship that Christ is looking for is different than the way we understand friendship. Amen. Because friends, when you're friends with the father, for example, or you're friends with your mother, understand, you sit and talking to mom, there are still terms you can't use. There are still places you can't go. There are things you cannot say. You have to say the final way to say what you say. Because if you cross that line... You step into disrespect, and once you do that, mom stops being the friend, then she becomes the disciplinary. If she does not do that, the reason she just falls apart, and you backslide. 
So as kids, the devil uses that to help us, to make us forget that friends tell kids. You know, mom can tell you that. Society today says that mom is not better than you are. You know, she just can't speak to you this way. You know, the society teaches you, you to do that. And we carry that on to our service to God and uh, treat God the very same way. If God loved me, he wouldn't do this and that. That is utterly disrespectful to the king. Because the king does what he wants. There is no democracy in the kingdom. But Jesus said, I will build my church, my kingdom. He says the kingdom of God, he speaks of God's kingdom where God places him as king. So Jesus calls the shots. He tells you what to do, and you do it. So there is no democracy in the kingdom. Especially not in Christ's kingdom. You can't pick and choose. You can't decide, I want this, I don't want that. This is just not fair. Or it's not correct, politically correct. It's all the devil's scheme. It makes sense to you as humans. In our culture, especially today, and our culture is warped and corrupt. You understand that? Okay, but in Christ's culture, nothing changes. 200 years. And I'll tell you how far that goes. Today, the Pope, if you heard that, it started in 2018. I, I've read that several times. Decides that the Bible does not fit today's lifestyle. Therefore, let's change the Bible and make it bring it up to date. So they are writing the Bible 2000. He didn't eliminate the Bible. He did not. Still calls it the Bible. But he adapted the Bible to today's culture. And we do the same thing in the church, don't we? We do the same thing. It's not fair to do this or that because that's not how people understand it today. I understand that. But I thank God and his uh, omniscience knew exactly how the, what circumstances the church would be living in in 2022. Amen. I think he knew that, didn't he? So I think if he knew that, and he didn't knew that the church needed to be adapted, then he would have every century created, updated the, his word to adapt the culture. If he didn't do that, that means he demanded, he wanted, expected that we do the reverse of that. That we adapt our life to his word, eternal word. So we cannot adapt the Bible to us, but us to the Bible. Amen. So you must be on the alert and watching these things. And they really make human sense when you hear them. But be careful what you emphasize. You emphasize Jesus as king, therefore you submit to him. Let's, let's see. Jesus is a friend because he's comforting. Jesus is a friend because he cares. He's a friend because he comes down to our level. Jesus is a friend because he lives within us. He says, I'm with you always. Yes, he is with us always, as long as we stay with him. He will never leave you, but you can leave him. When you leave him, he does not go looking for you, but he stands with arms outstretched. He says, come. Amen. Come. It's still your decision. So how do you see Christ in your book? If you see Christ as a king, as the authority, okay, your Christianity has been overly conservative. It's um, work, working like a, a dictatorship. Everything is done. There's no liberty. There's no feeling. There's no uh, slackness, no tolerance in what you do. And you see such Christians as well. They're not wrong necessarily. 
But the devil uses the emphasis that aspect of it to create a sense of uh, discomfort and, and slavery. So the world does not want to come because I don't want to come to this. This is just, you know, this is not right. Even though it is part of it, but Jesus stands up there inviting us to come. Though he says, you, you, my friend, if you respect what I say, though God has placed him as Lord and Savior over everything, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He does everything. God said that because he came down and offered himself. When God did that, he wanted us to be able to compartmentalize in our minds those um, relationships and find the balance. And God has made provision for that balance when he put in you his Holy Spirit, his spirit, helping you to understand in every circumstance how to understand Christ. I'm sick. I hurt. I want God to heal me. But I must also understand that God, he, he owns me. He's my king. He decides of my life at Will, whatever he wants to do. So I say to him, God, whatever your will is. God's will may be that I stay sick for 15 years and people coming and going, they're all learning and seeing how I'm sustaining the sickness, I'm dealing with it, and they all are encouraged by it. By the time I pass away, I have encouraged hundreds of fellow Christians. Amen. Thereby, my life has brought glory to God, And that's the point of us being created, to glorify God, to bring glory to him, not to satisfy our lives. And that's what causes us to focus on one aspect or another, because we focus on what we see as our personal need quite selfishly. Quite selfishly. From our experience, we grew up in an abused home we come to the church on either extreme. Either it is extra conservative, okay, you don't want to stray at all, or you come and reject all rules and regulations. And God is supposed to adapt to that. No. You know? God is a loving God. That's what you focus on. You come in the church, people walk in the, the outside, we go and push people to come in. They come in. We don't want to lose them, so we say, come as you are, which is the truth. Come as you are. But once you step into this building, into Christ's church, what happens? What happens? Life changes. Your perception changes. Okay? So if you focus on Christ as being the friend, the welcoming person, you will not enforce the principles of changing your mindset, the way you think about life, the way you see life, the way you live your life, the way you look, the way you dress, the way you do everything. You know? You won't do that. Tomorrow, President Joe Biden is coming to this church. You're invited to meet with him. Okay? How do you prepare yourself? How do you prepare yourself? What question do you ask preparing for this? One of the first questions I think I'm thinking of is, what is the dress code? How should I behave? Can I come and shake his hand? Or should I wait for him to invite me? You know? You see the respect? Because of his status as president. If you go to the queen, it's even worse. It's even worse. It's a whole ceremony. You know? And you're looking at Jesus sitting there as king of his church, of his kingdom, okay? And you come to him with, with not a thought, with all disrespect, and you expect him to accept it for, from you as worship. You don't think about it. How should I come in Christ's presence? And he is here sitting in our midst. He's here in our midst, right? The king is here. Yeah. The king is here. Our Lord is here. Amen. He calls us to full submission. Is your mind submitted? 
Did you come this morning knowing that you are coming to the king? Or are you just coming to see a friend? Jesus is your savior. Do you come to him with thanksgiving, with a grateful heart and submission? Because without him, you'd be lost. You'll be in the hands of the devil and his kingdom, and you'll be mistreated, and he's delivered you from that by giving up his own life for your sake. What is the level of your devotion to your Savior? How much are you willing to sacrifice? You say to yourself, well, uh, God said that, that uh, he's given us a gift, John 3, 6, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. It's a free gift. It's all free. Paul says that in, uh, in Ephesians 2, 8, you know, it is a great God's grace that he extends to all of us freely. But the grace of God extending freely means that you don't pay anything humanly for it. But he requires that you pay a price to accept the kingdom. What is that price? If any man wants to be my disciple, let him what? Renounce mother, father, wealth, material goods, anything that you have, even yourself. And pick up your cross and follow me. And if you can't do that, you're not his friend. You're not his subject. He's not your Lord. And I wonder if he is even your Savior. Because he wants you to pay the price. The price is self-sacrifice, submission. So the devil plays within all these nuances and make you focus on this or that. Once you focus on this, you ignore that. And when you focus on that, you ignore this. And therefore, you are in his control however you turn. I'm in missions. My temptation is to focus, is to respond to hurt and misery. So God, Jesus is a caring person. I preach the love of God. I try to show his love by caring for people. So I care for people so much that I don't emphasize Christian living. It's not their fault. They're uneducated. It's not their fault. They can't read. Okay? It's not their fault. They don't have anything. It's not their fault. It's okay if it's, they still because they can't help it. And that's my temptation as a missionary. And I tell my other temptation. As a missionary and Bible teacher, in a really satanic culture, my temptation is to go there and, you know, just hit the rules on people and tell them exactly how they're supposed to serve God. I'm tempted to do that. And the risk of that is people not responding. And I wonder how much of that I've done as mistakes in my ministry. And as we serve God, I think it is important to understand that Jesus is Lord. He is God. He is our Savior. He is the Lord of our life. He is all that he is because God has placed him. That Philippians says that God is giving Jesus the place, the, the position to be Lord over all as a result of him living his position in heaven, coming down to earth, taking on the form of a human, humiliating himself. When he rose from the cross, he ascended and he sits at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Now he rules his church. He says, I will build my church. He built it. He established the rules for it. We have the responsibility to submit to it. He is king, king of kings and lord of lords, we call him. That's what he is. The Bible says that in, in many verses that we are. Psalms 22 calls him. He is the one who rules over everything. Psalm 22, verse 28, or 27, 28. That's the power that God has given him. Given him, why? Because Jesus accepted being the word of God to come down on this earth and obey God, right up to sacrificing himself. Amen. It is a sign of total submission to him. To understand as we are in the church, as we live in our communities, as we relate to people, understand what aspect of Christ needs to be emphasized in what circumstance. 
so that you can have a balanced life, which requires you to always go to your friend in prayer and ask him for help, for, to, for enlightenment, to help you understand, to give you the wisdom to know how to deal with life and circumstances and know how to keep that balance between Christ being the king, being Lord of our lives, being our savior, our friend, our healer, the one we go to when we are scared, when we are afraid, the shepherd that guides us when we, are, when we stray, when we lose our path. We should know how to balance all of that, and the Bible gives us. So the more time we spend reading God's word and analyzing God's word, understanding the different aspects of God as it goes. And I mean, I could be uh, citing verses here, but the Bible is very well covered with all these descriptions. I hope you want to understand uh, models of people who have lived this life, very difficult, balanced life, and understand how to live with it. David is, very, is one of them, okay, who lived this life. And you see David as king, but understand that he is subject to a king. He submits to Christ. He understands his situation. When he sinned, he knows that he needs to humble himself. So he understood. He accepts his fault. He went in prayer, took, uh, took uh, sackcloth and, uh, and ashes and went into fasting, asking God, his master, his Lord, for forgiveness because he's offended his Lord. How many times do we do that in humility? How many times that you come into this place in awe of God's presence, of God's power? Have you taken the time to sit and meditate and think about how great God is? Have you thought about this universe, how God created that? How it all works together? You know, many times we think God created, as Genesis said, so we think God created planet Earth. No, he created everything that exists in the firmament. Amen. Every planet there is, every uh, uh, system there is on the planet, God created that through the word. It is a powerful God that we serve. Amen. It is a mighty God. He is the mighty king. And when you come into his presence, you should come with reverence and respect. You do his work. You work for the king. You know, we are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul said we are ambassadors. We represent the kingdom of God. When you go into the world, the world should see that we are special envoys for a kingdom greater than anything any man has ever imagined. So we should live as such. We should understand and know what all that is required of us, all that is said about it. We should stay in the word of God to understand him. Take time to do that. It's not a matter of you getting up, you say a prayer, you read a verse or two, and then you come to church and you go home. That is not enough. But spending time in God's word, spending time thinking about what you read, spending time connecting passages, verses together, understanding the context of God's word, helps you understand the mind of your Lord, the mind of your king. Helps you live a life that fits what he wants because you know all that he says. Because everything he says summarizes very simply into just a few sentences all that is said in this Bible. Very simple. If you can understand that it is God's love for humanity, he wants us to be submitted to him. He wants us to spend an eternity with him. And we are to go and tell people that. Because we couldn't do it ourselves, we tried twice. We tried twice. We tried in Genesis. After the sin. Didn't work. Chapter 5, chapter 5, 6, he destroyed humanity with the flood. And we started over again. Okay? We couldn't do it. So he picked for himself a people, the Jews. They couldn't do it. So finally what happened? He sent his son. His son came to show us the way. 
So we understand that this loving God that we serve, this all-powerful God that we serve, the King that we serve is the caring shepherd that leads us as well. And we should understand, as I say again, the balance between that, understand God. So as, I, as you can relate to family members, you know, you have a very uh, fun, loving grandfather, you know, who's in the house with the family, and uh, he plays with the two, three-year-olds, he crawls on the ground with them and play, but he also the grandfather who calls the shot in the house. Yeah. You know, because I don't care how old you are today, okay, your father is still your father. You know, I don't care what position you, you occupy in the world. Your father is still your father. Your mother is still your, your mother. So don't think that because I'm the president, I, I can destroy my mom. No, that's going to still be the, very, the, the truth for eternity. I'm still 32 years older than my daughter, my oldest daughter. She may become president or whatever she becomes. I'm still older than she is, and I still know more than she does. Such is true for God. We can never know more than he does. So even though you see him playing with you, blessing you, and uh, just having fun with you, he is still the one worthy of respect. Amen. He is still the one who calls your life. He gives it to you today, he can take it in a snap. You should remember that. As we serve God in this church, as I do in Haiti, as we all serve God everywhere, Everything we do is a demonstration of our submission to him. And the way to do that is by telling yourself that I want to submit my life to God and let him take full control of me. It's a, it's a matter of you deciding up here what you want to do, how you want your life to be with him. Because it all plays right here. Right here. So make the decision, the commitment to submit to God and to look at him from all perspectives. What aspect of my life emphasizes God in this position and neglects him on that position? Know that you are lopsided, you lose balance, and everything in life that loses balance does what? Goes down. You've backslid. So I just wanted to remind you today as you serve God in this community, as I serve him in Haiti, as Haiti Christian Mission does what it does, all the missions do what they do, we should remember that the very most important thing that we are called to do is to bring people to submission to God's kingdom by proclaiming one very simple message, that God loved us, he sent his son to this world to die for our sins, and he calls us to submission to him. A very simple message. Paul defined it in 1 Corinthians 15. Very simply. And he showed you the meaning of it in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And he tells you the outcome of that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Because when you become a new creation, another person, you walk with God, and you should walk this life with the balance that you have here because Jesus is Lord, not because uh, someone placed him, but his father did because he obeyed the father right to the death, Amen. death on the cross. And God has ascended him, as Paul said, told the Philippians in Philippians chapter, chapter, <coughs> chapter 2, a, verses what, 5 to 11, Paul described that as Jesus came down, accepted our humanity, and God raised him up to that position. We need to understand that and submit to it. We need to understand that our minds will never know more than his mind. So if you want to know what God wants, we should understand what God's, what's in God's mind. And God's mind is expressed in this book Amen. and no other. So if you stay with this book... If you walk with it, if you study it, you spend time in it, and you spend time in prayer, God's Spirit, who inspired this book, will illuminate you, help you understand it, and connect all the dots and give you a single picture of Christ, of the King. Help you understand God. 
It will give you a balanced understanding of God as you serve him. And I urge you to do that. Spend on time with God's word in prayer. With an open mind to understand, God will guide you. He will help you understand that. And you will work, work a life that pleases God. And that understanding that causes all the divisions in the churches. You know, we have all our pet peeves. Pet peeves, is that the word I'm looking for? Yeah. All our pet peeves serving God. And we, it's either that or, not, or nothing, you know? Either that or nothing. My focus is on missions. And I, well, that's all I care about. It's about missions. and wonderful. That, that, that mission is good, you know. But when you focus on mission, what do you do? You neglect the local area. Yeah. You neglect your family. Oh, no, I'm, I'm worried about this community. I want this community. But you forget the end of the world. Go study here in Jerusalem and Judea to the end of the world. You need to bring the gospel. If you don't understand the balance of doing that, knowing when to put your the emphasis on what, then you stray from God's will. Amen. And when you do that, the devil has the upper hand. Be alert. Be on the alert. Let your mind be always awakened and sharpened. And that can be done through prayer and the presence of God's word. God's spirit, through the word and prayer, keeps your mind sharp and focused. Take time for that. That's the best time you can spend in your entire life. I promise you. I thank you for these last four weeks. I think everyone who took one of the papers on the table, everyone who think about sponsoring a kid to allow a school to go forward, I thank you. And I particularly thank every one of you that support Alicia going to Haiti. I worry about her. I do. Haiti is not a place to be in right now. But she's courageous enough to go. And I know our God is powerful enough to keep her and sustain her. So we trust that. So she partners with me in helping Haiti. And you helping her does that to me too. I appreciate that very much because you're helping my people. That's all I want. Let's focus on the what's important about it. It's not feeding them that's important. It's not treating their illnesses that's important. What's important is teaching them to know Jesus and to serve him. Thank you.
just wanted to take just a minute before uh, I give this to Tim. Before I even talk about what I want to talk about for a second, I just, I tell you, I, I can't appreciate more what Shoe Bear has uh, been here this last month. I, could, I tell you, as Mike said, I could listen to him all day long. And uh, he is very anointed. And uh, we sure need to, uh, as he said, uh, uh, support his uh, Haiti mission and, uh, and Alicia. And that's kind of, again, what I want to talk about because I've got a little update for Young Life. And Young Life is more right here. And uh, it's a Christian mission. And I know it's been a while since I gave the little presentation, so you probably forgot everything I said. But that's what I want to do is we're going to have a, uh, like a meet and greet. And a tentative date is uh, March uh, 22nd on a Tuesday night. We're going to know more by Wednesday when I go to a committee meeting. But I'm on a committee to, that's brought uh, Young Life here, the Christian ministry that, uh, that uh, uh, develops youth leaders to go right into the schools and you will see them they've already been on your parking lot and you don't even know it probably but uh, uh, but Trey and Nikki Ridge are the area directors here they moved January 19th here now I it's our job as a committee to keep them here and so uh, uh, they're on the the ground that their boots is on the ground they've already been talking to Madison Central and and uh, Ferris Town. There's already a couple of teachers there that are already interested in being involved there. They've had several meetings with people. They've already had youth leader meetings at their house. So they're trying to get that started so they can teach them how to do it. And they'll be alongside with them doing that. And so my main uh, thing here at this moment is the invite that I really, really would like for you to see because it'll help meet and greet them. They'll uh, tell you maybe a little presentation. You'll be able to uh, talk with them and we'll probably have drinks and dessert I don't know yet but uh, I just want to take a minute just to say that so I could go on but I'm gonna quite <laughs> give this to Tim thanks Kurt hey, have a seat for a second guys uh, just to uh, and Schubert come on up bud come on up here the um, we wanted to say obviously uh, remind you we talked a little bit about the uh, Haiti mission Christian mission and, you know, you're looking for a place to support uh, some tr teaching. You know, Christ, in the, in the sermon, we're, we're studying Matthew a little bit now on Wednesday night, S Sermon in the Mount. Christ was teaching, right? And he was preaching. And then he was feeding and healing and all those things. But he was teaching and preaching first, right? So they've got to know uh, the reason. And it, it's a focus that, that Chuber has really brought to my attention. We need to make sure we tell them the gospel news. It's not a complicated story. We need to hit it. So we're looking at, at how we can give you something in your hand to give you a quick thing to remind you to how to drop it off, how to get that started. That's our job. That's our job. Our job isn't to get them in the seat. So we just got to get them so they know the spirit. Who's going to do it? The spirit's going to do it if we tell them. But they got to be told that is our job, to tell them. And after we tell them, Spirit will figure it out. Now, some of them are going to reject us, right? And we talked about that a little bit last Wednesday night. Some of them are going to cuss at you or say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in it. Good, you just, the Spirit is already starting to work on them, or they wouldn't have argued with you, <laughs> okay? So, you know, that's, don't feel like that's a defeat. You know, go on. Go on to the next one, right? And this man's doing this in, in Haiti, and, and we really uh, appreciate that along with, along with our wonderful Alicia, who's down there. And uh, we'll pray for her a little bit later again. But So I wanted to, wanted to say thank you again, sir. I appreciate it. How about I give him a hand of applause for coming down here. This, <clears throat> this couple, you know, is driving from Cincinnati down here every Sunday morning. So it's not like they live around the street here. So uh, we really, uh, really appreciate the fact that that he's done that, and we remind you if you're looking look at some things to help support. Uh, the other thing uh, in, in looking at tonight, uh, we're re meeting with a candidate tonight, an applicant tonight, okay? So be in prayer for the committee and the applicant, you know, because we're trying, you know, we're meeting with them tonight and tomorrow, and, uh, you know, that the Lord will lead us in him if that's the case, right? Because we're, we're looking for that person, um, that, that will do that and, and be, the, be what the Spirit wants us to do. And we're, we can't be in a hurry. And it, it gets, you know, you get wanting to be in a hurry, right? But we can't be. we got to let the Lord do what he's, what he's wanting to do. 
And, uh, he, you know, it's obvious so far from everybody we've had at this pulpit to help out that the Lord is with us, guys. We've heard some of the best sermons, right, that are spiritually led, that are Bible referenced, okay? And we could have easily had a real milky guy come up here and have a good time and all that could have happened. But we've had every one of them be people of God who have challenged us, have challenged us. And I think that we just got to keep that up. And I think that goes back to you guys. You got to keep in prayer for this whole thing because the devil goes after you when things are changing, right? The devil goes after a church when a minister leaves. The devil goes after a church when you go to decide to build something. You know, I want to build a new building, or you're going to do that. They'll go after you, okay? Uh, we were just at Big Hill yesterday, and just to say thank you to them. The tables we had, the round tables were from Big Hill, and, and Earl, I took them back yesterday, and they are now uh, the, the little uh, Christian school, by the way, has moved from Union to Union City to Big Hill because they're out of room in Union City. Praise the Lord, right? They're out of room, and they need our prayers, they're, you know, they're teaching him have Christian lessons, too, along with doing their schooling. And if I had young kids today, I don't know what I'd be doing. I'll tell you, I'd be looking for a place like that. Um, so, you know, be, be, have them in our prayers, too, because, you know, they're, there'll be somebody uh, trying to attack something, right? They'll, <laughs> they'll attack their building. They'll attack they don't have enough of this. They don't have enough room for that or, or whatever it is. They'll come after something. So be in prayer with that for them, too. And, uh, and we, we thank you for that. Um, oh, and I'll say, I'll say, note, May 16th, May 16th, on so Wednesday night uh, at 7 o'clock, we'll have our annual meeting. So note that. The annual meeting is on May 16th at 7 o'clock on a Wednesday here at the church to discuss some things more. But um, just wanted to hit, hit a few of those things. Uh, right now, why don't we, uh, any, uh, any other thing that anybody needs to bring up about anything? Okay, well, we'll go, we'll, we'll dismiss with prayer. Lord, we just, um, we thank you again for being our leader, for being our king, for being our savior, and for being all the things that Schubert referenced today. Please help us continue to be a church of the truth, using the Bible, not anything else but the Bible. We ask you right now to be the protector and the shepherd of our girls down in Haiti. Look over her, all of her folks down there, carrying your word. Ask them that they take your word first, but be with them and, to, and bless them and bless her and protect her. She's just landing here this morning sometime. So we ask for that. And Lord, we, we asked for your guidance and support for our president. We ask you for our president of Russia, our enemy. We ask that you intervene. We ask also for all the Christians in Ukraine right now that are involved. We ask that they're still having services somewhere and that you bless them and protect them. Be with us the rest of this week as we walk through the door into the mission field and looking for people to become part of the family. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.